Great to be back with another episode of The Smiley Show. I'm Charlie Holm. Goes without saying, you are, of course, Smiley Kaufman. Today feels a little bit like um, the week after Christmas, where you're like, you got all these cool presents and toys, but there's kind of like the come down, you're, the sugar high is wearing off, because I can't tell you how delighted I was to like see everybody discover the Victor Hovland episode in audio format and video format, you know, on social and all the ways that they did and enjoy it the way we did when we recorded with him. Uh, so I, j- I just kind of wanted to give that one last bump. I mean, if you, if you haven't listened to it or, or watched it, please go do that now, either at our Smiley Show podcast feeds or at youtube.com uh, backslash at the Smiley Show. You can see all of our full episodes there. Really, really cool to see him breaking down in that video. There was a 20 minute short game section you did with him that was so cool and loved hearing people react to that on PGA Tour Radio. But I just want to kind of give you the chance, you know, one more time to to look back and reflect on the way that episode was received. And just what were the coolest parts of that for you? It was a great interview. And, and we knew that going into it, that anytime you have someone like Victor Hovland, who's somebody that, you're, that you've watched, uh, you know, throughout the last couple of years, how good he is talking to the media and just the type of perspective that he brings. I felt like when we got our script together, we had a pretty good idea that this was going to be a dang good interview and uh, (laughs) it didn't disappoint. You know, it was, it was great that Victor was, was so open, but also, you know, played along really well with what I really was curious about was his short game, his full swing, just every, every topic that we got into, he had such a great answer and uh, definitely, you know, it, it was, it was just, it's been pretty cool just how many people have reached out and said they've listened to this interview and, uh, and, and really enjoyed it. So that's from, from my standpoint, that's great. You know, get, when I got into this, uh, podcast business for me, you know, my only goal is really for people that listen at home was, you know, I just wanted people to feel, I want them to feel inspired. I wanted them to laugh a little bit, but also I wanted them to learn something. And mm. I think like that episode itself was like the first one, like, where people were watching and listening They're like, you know what? I really learned something from this episode. And uh, we've had plenty of other ones that I feel people can take away, whether it's uh, laughter from JT stories or <laughs> inspiration from somebody like Marty fish. So we try to pack th- that all into those Thursday interviews. And I really felt like uh, especially the learning piece of, of that last episode was so good with Victor. Yeah, we got tagged in. This was a, a really cool moment uh, to see. We got tagged in a, in a post of like a young player, you know, probably in his. Uh, it, it couldn't couldn't have been any any older than young teens and his coach that were working on bunker game shots and tagged us and said, "Hey, we we saw the video with Smiley talking to Vic about the work he did and and the way he improved in the bunker. And now we're trying to apply some of that here. It's so like that was that was a really cool moment among you know many others. But I think you know a lot has to be said for what a great sport Vic was and, and, and what a, and it, it's a, the, the most common text I got from friends or people who watched this week or listened was just like, man, it's amazing. He's one of the best players in the world, but he's also like an incredibly down to earth human being and just seems like a really fun and a good hang. And I, and I think that, you know, his personality really catered to a fun conversation. It was, it was cool watching that dynamic play out with the two of you. So, yeah. So again, yeah, if you haven't checked it out, go do it now. Um, but here at Christmas, Christmas week's over. We're on to the new year, and uh, <laughs> feels like it's going to feel like Christmas next next yes. Sunday when that clock changes and it gets dark at four thirty here in Birmingham. Ooh. I'm gonna that's that's when it's like you know what Christmas. The, anytime you hear it on the radio now, it mm. just makes sense because that sunset way earlier golf season. Now when you get that uh, one o'clock tea time, you're not finishing. So <laughs> we're we're right around the corner where golf season's uh, unfortunately ending. I, I'm curious what your conversations with Francie have been like. I got a, sent a chart by Amanda this morning that was like <laughs> the staged sleep thing we're supposed to do to get Walker from because when daylight savings hit, that means he waking up an hour earlier. Yeah. So, so we, we're, we're, Francie <laughs> mentioned that this morning. So we're <laughs> she's like, yeah, I need to look into that when daylight savings time hits because we're um, very schedule oriented. I've got uh, a we, chart for you. Can send it over. You're supposed okay, to kind please. of gradually move Anna Carter please, to sleep, <laughs> <laughs> sleeping in later and going to bed later because otherwise it's going to be an absolute nightmare on November 5th. So um, that's hashtag just dad things. Uh, we're later in this episode, really looking forward to this as a architecture nerd. You're going to talk to, we're going to talk to 
uh, Michael Wolf, who is at Bama Bearcat on Twitter. Um, but before we get to that, I want to toss it to to you because you had a super cool week in down in Jupiter, Florida, and a lot of that centered around a very new golf course that uh, with one of your good buddies that's near and dear to your heart. So let's just you know t- tell us a little bit about the week you had in Jupiter. Yeah, it was it was a great week down in South Florida. Took Francie and Anna Carter. Uh, we flew down there. I think it was on Monday, and really the purpose for the the visit was hosting a Q and A for Justin mm-hmm. and Ricky at a NetJets event at a thousand North a restaurant down there. And I'll speak on that. It was a great evening. It was fun. I think it's always weird for those guys when I kind of get into work mode because like the first <laughs> like couple minutes. It was like they were really struggling, like to start taking my question seriously and like, wait, wait, okay, wait, he's somebody in the media. I need to focus right now because like I can't stop laughing at him because I've seen too much. <laughs> and that, that kind of is how it went. Was, and Jordan was the same way when we, we got on, on the podcast and uh, the first like five minutes of our interview with him earlier this year. <laughs> he was like, I just can't get used to it yet. But eventually we got in a great <laughs> rhythm. Uh, it was a great evening, a lot of uh, great insight from those guys. But uh, besides that, yeah, Justin mentioned is like, hey, do you want to go check out Panther National? And I was wow. like, yes, uh, twist my arm. <laughs> and <laughs> and we went out there, and checked it out, man. And I, I will say it, it as far as expectations go, it it was it it was above that, man. Uh, wow. like I had high expectations and it was definitely above that. So really cool. Very, you know, I think the takeaway for me is so many memorable holes. And Hmm. I think so often with golf courses, I just want to be able to go one through 18 in my head and be able to remember exactly what it looked like. And too often on golf courses where I'm like, uh, what, what was 12, 13 and 14 again? Cause I'm a guy, I I seriously can remember just about every hole I've ever played. Like that's the type of, uh, golf memory I have, or just memory in general. Um, and now that, that didn't, it translated somewhat in school and the fact that I could remember like things, but necessarily concepts and stuff. That's a whole different, (laughs) that's a whole different bargain when things like an econ, when things are going up and things are going down, it's like, those are things that are tougher to remember. But besides the fact back to Panther national got on a little tangent there. It was, it was, did you do that on purpose? Was that a math? Was that a math joke? uh, Uh, No, I honestly, no, I honestly don't even know what you're talking about. School school subject (laughs) on the brain. I wasn't a math guy either. So anyway, we digress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, it was it was really good. Um, I'll say one of the holes, we played the back tees. I think this was um, 14. And people were like, wait, I thought you remember every hole you played. Well, I, I can't remember the holes, the numbers right now. So 14, I think it was this end of the win. It was blown 30 this uh, the day that we played, which was not mm. good for my game, by the way. I, was, I hit some, if you ask Justin how I played, he'd be like, well, he had moments of brilliance and then moments of just like pure 10 handicap stuff. And I'm like, well, that's kind of where it's been lately. It's either been really good or it's kind of been really bad. So whatever. Um, but we all hit drivers off the tee and then all hit drivers on the second shot and still wow. came up short of this par four. It was like wow. maybe 520 yards or something. This par four didn't even get there. Um, so <laughs> Justin's like, yeah, that's my bad. We should have played the up tee. He's like, well, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> it made me feel terrible. So many pars, see, but you want to see the whole course. You know what I mean? That's it. If you make a par, you make a par. It's all that matters. It goes Listen, on the scorecard. You do not have to test me, uh, or challenge me to want to hit a driver off the deck. That's something I always like to do. So I was not against it, but into a par four, I'd rather do it into a par five. I must say. Mm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but Panther nationals great. Had a great crew. Uh, shout out Brad Gale, Lance Young, um, and man, I'm trying to, and, and Mike Thomas played too, JT's dad, but we then went to Grove the following day, which man, that place, it continues to get better. Grove is Michael Jordan's golf course. And yeah. it's, if you've ever talked to any pro there or anybody that's ever been there, first off, like you want to be there on a day that MJ's there and MJ wasn't there the day that we played. and all of all of the the guys in the shop or caddies uh, or even some members it's funny when they say the days that mj is not there the place is dead but days that mj is there and, and people know he's going to be there it's like crowded so i think that's kind of i think that's kind of funny but so pace uh, of play was probably good then you know, oh, dude, just, we played <laughs> jt and i played just a twosome and i think we probably played and shoot uh we, we were kind of practicing hanging out 
we played in no more than like two and a half hours, just flew around. Uh, but that golf course, since I've played it probably three or four years ago, has really grown in and the greens mm. were perfect. And the pro shop has all the uh, the jump man stuff like that's pretty cool to me. Got a got a jump man hat. <laughs> I mean, I Speak had my to, language. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Mr. Mr. UNC. I know you like yeah. that. So, yeah, we won't talk about the UNC Georgia Tech game at all this week. But uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's let's, let's I'll, digress. <laughs> I'll say this about my golf game. JT, after watching a couple too many shots go to the right the day before, I did some good shots, but he saw, he's like, all right, I've seen too much. We have got to figure out what this problem is on this specific shot. And he gave me a three minute lesson. And that's, uh, so I guess now he's officially my swing coach. Uh, now that he gave me, now I've watched four golf balls. So I think he has to be. Yeah. So Justin Thomas is my uh, instructor, but yeah, we, we worked on keeping my height in the backswing. Okay. So like think Max Homa, how like tall he stays yes, in his backswing. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I'm what he even said. It's like your chest is going down in, in the backswing. So like I, I'm turning, but like my chest is going down. So it like causes me to get lower. And then I'm already a guy in the downswing who gets lower. And mm. for somebody that that sh- has been struggling with width in their arms, it's it's just always there's never enough room. So he said, you just got to stay tall and turn and then just still try to keep a little bit of height in your downswing. And started hitting some good shots, uh, started getting some control and really never hit those big right shots. So that was that was nice to uh, have something to work on this offseason, if you will. I mean, that's a guy that's been working on a swing to a fair, fair degree the last couple of months. So definitely in that mindset, I'm sure a lot of those swing thoughts for him were, you know, were, were, were quite applicable. And, you know, I, I know that. We did the full analysis with Michael Neff, which is a really cool thing. But it feels like there's a there's maybe a lot a lot of things going on in your brain right now. What, what is when you're talking about staying tall? How does that does that connect at all to what he was trying to illustrate? You know, when he was comparing your your swing to to Rory's uh, when it comes to the side bend. I'm curious on on or, or is there no connection whatsoever between you know kind of the, the height and, and the length you're trying to create? Well, one of the things that you know that Michael may note to me is that I just tend to get steep. So steepness is not good for somebody like myself who, who struggles with, with losing height. So when you lose height in your downswing, meaning like you're, you're getting closer to the ground. So effectively like the, your arms and shoulders and and hands that are connected to the grip of the golf club connected to the club face. So the more you move down, the more, the more room you run out of your low point really is behind the golf ball. Mm-hmm. Okay. So for me, once I get halfway down and I realize, oh crap, like I need to make room here. I have got to make room for my arms and this club face to not hit behind the golf ball. So what do I instinctively do? I stall out. I start to stop turning. So what I do is I get down here, I stop turning, and then all that can move is my arms as, as the mic goes away, I need to, I need to my head, need, for those watching on YouTube right now, you can see me going this way, but <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll have too much like, um, bend in my left arm. My, my shoulder will have too much side bend, kind of what Michael was talking about. And one of the big things that he said is that it's such a big killer for people is when you side bend too early out of the top. Well, let's say I don't side bend early at the top, but do it, but do it late. And, and stall. So like my big issue is like not necessarily side bending right out of the top. It's actually side bending at the bottom, which is fine, which is what you're supposed mm-hmm. to do. But I stop turning. So when you stop turning, mm. that's when you run into the left shoulder. Right? And, and then just goes yeah, through, yeah, you yeah. have the high handle yeah. toe right. gets into the ground. You can't have the club exit left. And that's been something I've been fighting for a long time. And I really think if I can focus on this, and just get comfortable with like being that tall and and just being that far away from the ball I'm, because instinctively you just want to push into the ground as hard as you can because you're mm-hmm. trying to create power and sometimes it's not that's not the correct type of power if that makes sense because sometimes when you're when you're turning into the ground with your feet and you feel like you're creating all this this pressure to be able to eventually jump like you are like you're doing a jump or a box jump 
sometimes it's just, it's not the right thing because if you watch any long drive guy, watch what they do. They stay as tall as they possibly can. They don't want to go down at all. So that means in the downswing that they can drop to eventually push up. Now, I think I'll naturally for a guy that likes to have a ton of speed in my golf swing, I just naturally can hit it hard. The more up I can go on the backswing, the more down I can go. But if I can feel like I stay taller in the downswing, it's good. I'll still like naturally have a lot of down just because I I want to hit it hard. But if I can focus on that, that'll help get a little bit room or a little bit more room for my arms to be able to get down to eventually then side bend correctly to where then I can rotate and have that club exit more left. Well, listen, I'm just glad to hear that JT has officially joined the Smiley Kaufman team. Uh, <laughs> keep an eye on this space in, in the coming weeks and months. Is, uh, it was is Jordan. It, Jordan was my guy. Now, Jordan. now, J, now I'm, I'm going. Jordan was my swing coach, and now it's JT. So we all go through instructor changes. You know, it's just <laughs> the way of life. This is how things go. Um, I, I want to get back, Ashley, quickly to uh, to Panther National because. Like I, I just, I, I love, I think it's such an interesting um, thing for a course designer in a modern era where we look at all the great courses and, you know, the thing you can't create out of thin air is, is the sort of the history or, or, a, or a classic feel, um, you know, because that's, that takes time. Right. Um, but creating a course that's memorable is kind of the one thing you can do, not to the point of, of, of gimmicks or being, you know, overly zany where you're like, what are we even doing here? This isn't, this isn't even golf, but uh, do you have any comparisons you know, th- that you can make to Panther National just in terms of the feel of the course? Obviously, you noted it's, of course, a South Florida course. It's going to be windy. That's going to be a huge um, you know, defense that the course is going to have. But, but in- anything that the audience could kind of you know, connect it to to understand what type of a golf course it is? Yeah, I think there's some definitely some room off the tee, which I think that was one of the takeaways from all of us. It's like, yeah, if, you, you know, if you're driving it well, like you're going to have plenty of opportunities, but I thought there was a great mix of second shots and, and different visuals that, that you have. And I really like golf courses that the par fives and par threes tend to go in different directions, meaning like you're not going to be playing in the same wind direction. And too often I'll play the golf courses that are, are the exact same par three yardage in the exact same wind direction. It's like 178 yards downwind and you have it like two or three times that day. This golf course, all the par threes are going in different directions. The par fives are the same way, going going in different directions. And and playing overseas in Scotland uh, a little bit this year, and I haven't played a ton of golf over there, is you tend to have a lot more kind of blind tee shots. And there was a couple out there that reminded me of golf in Scotland. Oh, and, interesting. And if you see the property around Panther National, I mean, dude, it's it's like swampland around like farmland. It's flat as can be the amount of dirt they had to move to get some of these vistas out there that it, it kind of brings you in high. And then, and then the second shots in or kind of feel like you're hitting into more of a tunnel low shot. So okay. it's, it, to me, it's kind of cool how you can have eight to 10 yards of elevation change at a golf course in South Florida. And you kind of have a movement of the property that I think fits you know, you feel like you're somewhere else. And I'm not saying it's a Lynx golf course, but there are some characteristics that separate it from, um, you know, a lot of the golf courses that you ever see in South Florida. So I really like that aspect. And um, yeah, it's, it's, there's definitely some water. I, I, I will say, Charlie, that there is some water. It caught my eye a couple of times and it caught a lot of my golf balls. I'm not going to lie. That <laughs> it's, you know, this is, listen, this is, this is playing golf in South Florida. Uh, it's so interesting what you, having not ever seen the property at all, what you're describing reminds me a lot of what Tom Watson did in, in Kiowa, which is a South Carolina low country course with the front nine of Cacique, where I don't know if you, have you played Cacique at all before? I, I haven't but been to Kiowa Island. No. It, it, man, the front nine there feels like, uh, like it, it was pulled straight out of Scotland. Like it's like a link style. <laughs> That's course. amazing. It is so cool, but it is all those same topographical features that are, you know, s- kind of swamp and marsh and low country stuff like that. You have some water features. And so, and, and I, and I'll say I loved that course. So Panther National, if that is the, the way it is, that's going to be a really cool playing experience. Well, definitely. And, and there's, there's, 
I would say that's just like a, a piece of the place. You still yeah. have holes that remind me of, oh, Jack Nichols a thousand percent had his fingerprints on this yeah. hole. But there was, you know, like an island green on a par four that I thought was was awesome because we played it back into a 30 mile an hour wind. I hit wow. driver nine iron from 120. And I was like, if I if I miss this at all, it's going to end up in the water. So it, that was a really cool shot. And yeah, it, there's it was really fun. And uh, I think. You know, <laughs> I think JT's words were, you know, when I got out there, I was a little nervous, you know, because I didn't know how it was going to play or how it was going to, you know, if I was going to like it. And I think he even said, I don't want to use his words, but um, something along the lines of like, this is just really cool, like playing a golf so course awesome. that you helped design. And, you know, I haven't done that. So I, I imagine walking around a golf course and being like, I actually had some say so in what this place looks like. I think that's pretty awesome. Did did he say it all? Maybe it's too early, but is this something where it's kind of piqued his interest a little bit and he wants to do more of this in the future? Like, well, what impact did this have on him in terms of his, I mean, obviously he has some interest in, in designing golf courses if he signed up to do this one with Jack Nicholas, but is this like something he's going to pursue as, as a passion in the future? Maybe uh, you would think so, right? I think yeah. he's definitely, it's ticked his interest for sure. Uh, I would say, that when you're involved in your first project like this, I think the easy part for him is the golf course like part. He's like, you know what? Like that's to me, like his golf knowledge, like brings some added value. But I, I guarantee the things he's picked up on more are all the things that goes into building a golf course. Yeah. Meaning like what you're looking for, you know, can you build here? How like budgets? Like, I mean, I'm sure he's not too involved in stuff like that, but I guarantee you when I bet Jack has told him some things about, uh, how you know how to do it, or just watching him work. Some some things that he probably picked up on that I'm sure he's like, wow, there's a lot more than just you know designing a really cool dogleg left par four. It's like it's like, is this where the water is going to go? Like, where's the next hole going to be? It's, I'm sure there's just a lot more to it that that I'm sure JT picked up on. But uh, a dang good piece yeah. of property for sure. That's super cool. I mean, Tiger Woods has a design firm. Tiger Woods has been a mentor to Justin Thomas. Wouldn't wouldn't hate seeing those two partner up in the future, do of course. But uh, that that's really really cool. I'm excited to see more uh, of of that as as images come out as we get some more information on the course. And look, this is just the beginning of our golf course discussion on this episode because now we have uh, an interview kick over to with Michael Wolf. So Michael is, I think probably most people know him as, as Bama Bearcat on Twitter. Uh, he is the president of 288 Sports, and he is the author of a book called The Golf Courses of Seth Rayner. Uh, so we're going to chat with Michael uh, about a lot of things, your friendship, you know, how you guys kind of came together, some prep he's helped you with. Um, but we're going to kind of try to dig into that Golf Magazine World Top 100 list that recently came out and get his thoughts on that. So uh, let's get over to that conversation with Michael Wolf. Well, you guys heard the intro. Luckily, we are joined by Michael Wolf. And Michael, I mean, you and I, dude, we go pretty far back. I mean, it's, it's Shoal Creek, you and I, uh, just our relationships, uh, a lot, a lot really starting with you telling me one day, it's like, Hey, I represent Jim Herman. And I was like, wait, what really? You're an agent. And it was just like, from, from then since you and I have had so many different conversations about PJ tour travel and just, you know, it's a great person to bounce things off when, when things, when I wasn't doing well, you always had great advice for me, but we're both in the media world now. So it's kind of, it's kind of wild how we're, we've progressed through this world of golf. Yeah. Somebody's made a huge mistake, but uh, I'll take it. That's fine. As long as the, the check's cash, we'll take, the, we'll take it. <laughs> well said. I mean, we can see the books behind you. I mean, yep. you have more books about golf than I have shag bag balls of Srixons here at the house. So, I mean, what, you're a historian, man. Like, it's, it's incredible to me, your knowledge of how much you uh, know about golf, but you're so – I mean, it's something that's – it's your passion, how long have you been into just golf in general? I know you've probably played a long time, but just the history of the game. Uh, really, since I was a teenager. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I stink at golf. So if, if you're not very good at golf, <laughs> um, knowing a lot about it is a good way to stay involved, even though, you know, my dreams. Or get a good partner. <laughs> yeah, or finding a good partner. That's right. Um, yeah, so I grew up in Cincinnati. I caddied. Um, I started caddying in the seventh grade caddy, you know, the caddy programs in Cincinnati were and still are a big, big deal up there with the Evans Scholar programs and everything. Um, 
I got sick in uh, my senior year of high school. I got sick and um, with Crohn's disease, and just off and on, I battled it for uh, really about five years, um, and and couldn't play much golf. And so to you know to kind of keep me occupied and and out of trouble, and it was you know it was kind of the go to thing that people would either bring me or talk to me about. And so people started bringing me golf books, and I didn't really. I didn't care too much about instruction books and things like that because I wasn't playing much golf. So the idea of like, here's the right position for your wrist or here's where you're mm. want your left foot to be or the ball position stuff that didn't really ring a bell with me. But when I would read about, you know, places in Scotland that I had never heard of, uh, Michael Bamberger wrote a book called to the Lynx land. And, you know, um, I just remember that one and thinking, you know, I was, I was literally laying in a hospital bed when I read it at, at 16 years old. And I thought I'm gonna get out of this hospital and someday I'm gonna go play you know, North Barrick and these other places, Macrohonics that he talked about. And, uh, you know, through, through the grace of God, uh, I have, and it's just been a wonderful ride. I'm, you know, I'm one of those guys that's just, uh, I've been lucky. I've just been lucky. One lucky thing in life after another, <laughs> been very fortunate and a lot of people helped me out and, uh, yeah, it's been fun. It's been a good ride. Well, you mentioned a couple of books there and Michael, if, if I needed a starter pack of, of five books and I, I, I know golf architecture and golf history at a very surface level. You know, I, I kind of know what I watched on TV, just what people have told me on a golf course, but not to the to the depths that I want to eventually know more about this this great game. What would be the five or whatever books that come to your mind where you're where you tell somebody if you want to learn more about architecture, you want to learn more about history or just players, what books come to mind for you? Well, anything by a guy named Bernard Darwin. So Bernard Darwin was, um, he's the grandson of Charles Darwin. Um, Bernard Darwin was a correspondent. He wrote a, he wrote a, um, a newspaper column for the London times. And he's another one of those guys. I mean, you talk about right time, right place. Uh, Bernard Darwin, um, he, he was the official score. He was a scorekeeper for the playoff between Harry Varden and Francis Wilmette in 1913. They, they needed like an unbiased, you know, observer. And since he was, he was in the Disney there, movie. Yeah, from Good Great Britain. His column, <laughs> his column the night before literally ended with the line, tomorrow might just be the greatest game, you know, ever played. Um, that's how he ended mm. his column the night before. So, um, yeah, I would say anything by Bernard Darwin. Um, a lot of his columns have been put into kind of uh, anthologies. Those are great. Um, if you're interested in architecture, um, Tom Doak has wrote up several books on, on golf architecture that are all fantastic. Um Anatomy of a Golf Course is a great one that, you know, you can buy a used copy online for $10. So that's a great one. I like all of Bamberger's stuff. Um, I think Alan Shipnick's new book is interesting, you know, about everything that's gone on with Liv and, um, you know, kind of life and times of the modern tour. I think John Feinstein has uh, some of his books about, um, you know, he's written books about very specific, either like a year on tour with kind of where he followed some grinders and not some famous guys. A good, It's called A Good Walk Spoiled. Um, he wrote another one mm. about just um, the U.S. Open at Bethpage. I think that was a you know interesting book about the tour. Um, the best instruction book I ever found was uh, – it's not really an instruction as far as your swing instruction. It's like how to manage yourself on a golf course with Jack Nicklaus. And I, it's, I believe it's called 55 Ways to Lower Your Score. Really? It's, it's That's just interesting. Little, yeah, it's little things. It, you know, licking your ball before you put it back down to putt on a downhill putt that's super fast. What? Like a little bit of moisture on it to slow the ball down as it rolls downhill, and just just little is things. Is that like legal? That. I don't think that's legal, is it? Like, Can you do that? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I, I think so, or it was then. But um, just little things about like what to do if you make a triple bogey in the first hole. You know how to gather yourself, and just little things like that. That um, you know, for me, that's a little more. Uh, th- those things were a little more to like learn and like apply to my game than than you know how to pronate my wrist. You know, like Ben Hogan's talking about. <laughs> the five fundamentals or whatever. Um, oh gosh. Yeah. Well, so yeah. Um, yeah. I, I like it all though. I'm, I'm one of those nuts. I am, I am a hardcore, uh, I'm a sicko. I mean, I like, I like all of it. Um, I like the books. I, mean, I like playing golf. I like, come on everything. in brother. Yeah. The water's warm. <laughs> yeah. charge. Man. So let's say I'm a young professional that is in, let's say in New York, in the finance world. And, All you know, there's so many great golf courses in New York, and I'm gonna go out and play with my boss. And I want to know, like, if if he if my boss starts talking about a Redan Green, I want to know what that is. 
yep. and or just any type of architecture type of stuff that it's like yep. a surface level. I just want to know what these words mean. What was the was there a book that you mentioned there uh, for just like just learning all about golf architecture as it dates back to the early 1900s? Yeah, I, w- I would say Tom Doak's book, Anatomy of a Golf Course, is a great is a great book. I mean, it's 20 years old, but it's it kind of explains you know um, his thoughts on strategic golf versus kind of heroic golf and and why wide fairways are better than the skinny fairways and, and um, you know risk reward and the line of charm and all these things. Um, a lot of it isn't necessarily new thinking. It's just um, I think between Tom and Gil Hans and uh, and uh, Corin Crenshaw. They've just, you know, they were the first ones to kind of, um, you know, sometime in the early 1990s, they realized like, hey, you know, building fancy golf courses and, and expensive to maintain and a lot of stuff that happened after World War II with whether it was Fazio or Robert Trent Jones or whatever, like, let's make this more simple and just make it a game that's, uh, you know, build golf courses that are easy to walk, uh, golf courses where you can play 18 holes without worrying about losing a golf ball. And, um, you know, I think those things are, are pretty timeless. And, um, you know, th- those are the golf courses I like. I mean, I, I uh, you know, any golf course I, I where don't... I can play a few holes and not worry about losing a ball is a good golf course. <laughs> me, <so>. me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, 100%. our home course isn't one of those. Well, we talk about books and, and I would say a year and a half ago, I, I got my first job offer to work an event at the PGA Championship at Southern Hills. And I didn't know anything about TV. I didn't know what was going to be the requirements. I didn't know if I showed up and the TV network handed me a test and say, I want you to tell me everything you know about Southern Hills right now. And I just, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so naturally, before I go to Southern Hills, I'm like, who knows something about Southern Hills so I could start doing some prep? <laughs> call Michael Wolf. Bang, bang, bang. So I give Michael a call and I, and I say, dude, you got to help me out with Southern Hills. I know you know stuff about this place. We have to meet up. And we met up at a Panera. And you gave yeah. me a couple great books. Yeah. I mean, I just, again, I just – I like everything about it. I like the history. I like the little fun facts. To me, it's uh, you know, it's not so much like the memorization of like, well, who won the U.S. Open in 1914, and, and who won the PGA Championship in 1950, and you know, uh, how how far is the 18th hole in uh, at Pebble Beach when it opened versus today? I, I I like the little interesting things, you know, just the little quirks of the game and and the little, uh, you know, the, the little things that happen, um, you know, over the course of history. I think that's one of the great things about golf, right? Is that anywhere you go in the world, it's still like. You start with your ball on a little peg, and there's a flag down three or four hundred or five hundred yards away, and you got to get that ball in the hole. But you know, I've played golf in Japan, I've played golf in China, uh, you know, I play golf in Vestavia, Alabama, and no matter where you play, like even if you don't speak the same language as the people you're playing with, I could be playing with my grandfather, I could be playing with you know someday hopefully my grandsons, and it's still the same game of like getting the ball in the hole. And it's just so interesting to me. To me, it seems like the only game in the world that. Um, you know, you can go. To, you can go to Japan and play 18 holes with somebody who doesn't speak a word of English, and you don't speak a word of Japanese. But you can figure it out as you go along. And same thing with like, what other game can you play where you can play with somebody who's 80 years old or somebody who's eight years old, and and both of you can still have a good time. You know, uh, if you're playing, you know, tennis or whatever, and you're playing against somebody who's way better than you or way worse than you, you know, one of you ain't gonna have a very good afternoon. But uh, in golf, you can still, you know. As long as everybody plays fast, keeps up, and is ready to play when it's their turn, I like playing golf with anybody. So, yeah. Michael, on the topic of books, so I yeah. consider myself somewhat of, a, of an amateur sicko. Like I have mm-hmm. all the makings of a sicko, but I don't, I don't know that I fully indulge myself in, in, in learning or understanding uh, golf architecture in its fullest form. Um, and as an amateur sicko, I, I, I know that C.B. McDonald was kind of the guy, like maybe one of the forefathers of, of American golf architecture. And yeah. Seth Rayner, in a lot of ways, was his protege, right? Yeah. And so you, you wrote a book, the, the Golf Courses of Seth Rayner. I uh, and just to kind of start there, there, I, I, I know, which was very, it was very uh, humble of you to not mention that in the list of books that we should be going out and buying. Right. Uh, but we'll say that now, you know, hey, go, go do that. Um, sure. What what interested you in, in Seth Rayner specifically? You know, just, you know, is it something about the way he advanced the work that C.B. McDonald did or, or what, what, you know, subject matter there interested you? Well, a couple of things. Um, first, from kind of a practical standpoint, there wasn't a book about Seth Rayner um, on these shelves behind me. Hmm. I've got books on, on, basically every other architect, um, of note, um, in the world. 
Seth Rayner, um, he didn't play golf. He was not a golfer. And that also always kind of fascinated me. Like he's the pretty much the only big name architect who didn't play golf at all. Like when he, he built several golf courses with Stephen McDonald before he even like tried to play golf for the first time. And to me, that was part of the fascination, but definitely part of it too, was just that like longing for like, I wish somebody would write a book about this guy. And then a friend of mine named John Cavalier who runs um, links gems on Instagram. He's got a huge Instagram following and, and puts up beautiful photography. He had mentioned uh, that basically he had almost completed um, going to every Seth Rainer golf course that's still around and um, had taken you know photographs of them all. And, you know, we had talked about, well, that would make a good book. Like the, you know, the, one of the nice things about Seth Rainer's golf courses, they're very um, photographic. Um, he used, you know, not necessarily geometric shapes, but just kind of unusual green shapes and um, bunkering around the greens. Um, and, and, and with the, with the invention uh, and the growth of uh, drone photography, it, he's one of the main, his golf courses, like they show up better from the air than they do from ground level. Like it really helps to be able to see what's going on. Some golf courses like are pretty easy to tell what's going on from, you know, from the tee when you stand on the tee, his, um, they're just, they're much more photogenic for whatever reason from, you know, 20 or 30 feet in the air. And so John came and said, Hey, I, you know, I've been to all these courses. And, and at that point I had been to most of them. And we said, well, let's, you know, let's make an effort to see the rest of them that we haven't seen and kind of dig into it. And um, yeah, it's been a good adventure. It took us about three years and uh, the book is out next week. Uh, back Nine Press uh, released it. It's it's Back Nine Press. Uh, nine is just the number nine. So backninepress.com. And uh, yeah, the reaction's been uh, it's been kind of crazy. Uh, it's it's flattering. It's you know nerves. I, I've written one golf book before, so this is my second book. And uh, so it's, you know I sent the manuscript in whenever six months ago, and you know we went to you know get it printed and get it bound and all that and now the books are due back and uh as the orders have come in and you think uh, oh boy like i hope it, it you know i hope it lives up to everybody's expectations but i know the worst case scenario the photographs are beautiful that's what i keep telling everybody is you know even if you don't like what i do <laughs> fantastic so and it I looks most, pretty right <laughs> yeah most people will be surprised at how many um how many courses um he actually built um and how many different places um, you know we we know his famous ones like fisher's island or or uh, mm -hmm. um you know lookout mountain or, or uh, Gaiman's Hall, but um, yeah, he built he built quite a few golf courses uh, that, that people I wasn't aware of some of them even when we started the project. So yeah, it's been, been fun. There's been one the one that he collaborated on with McDonald um, that I'm particularly interested in that we are going to come back to when we talk about a little bit later the the World Top 100 list that we're going to discuss. And it's and so my, I have a two part question for you here. The first is do we call do we call this golf course the Lido or the Lido? Uh, yeah. And, and my, my second question is because th th this course has such a fascinating interest, uh, a history of, of, you know, when it was built at the time, some of the game's greatest players talked about this course as being one, one of the best in the entire world. Right. And then for World War Two, it gets basically destroyed and used as as a naval base. Right. right. And then, yeah. you know, recently in, in, in the years you know since that, that, you know, Sand Valley, there are a couple other courses up there, a short course. And, and they, you know, as far as I know, ha have you know, recreated that course to a painstaking level of detail in, in the, the sort of the sandy terrain out there in Nakusa, Wisconsin. So um, it, when it comes to that course, is, is that something you, you, you play yet? Are you interested in like, what do you think of that project in general, given it, it's one of these classic McDonald Rayner collaborations? Yeah. Uh, so I was up there, uh, I guess, two or three weeks ago. Got to play it uh, three times. Oh, wow. And wow. Um, I, so I knew, yeah, I knew the, so a, a, night, a great uh, guy named Peter Flory, um, who's a friend. Um, Peter is a world-class hickory golfer and, and loves golf research and all that. And um, Peter, it started as a video game. So he was interested in, you know, he, you know, he'd seen all these lists from, of the bet, like you mentioned, the best golf courses, you know, uh, from 1930 or whatever. And Lido was always in the top like five. I mean, it was always mentioned up there with the, you know, the Shinnecocks and the, and the Chicago golfs. And, and it was always, you know, right up there among the greatest golf courses in the world, but it had been gone for so long. And so Peter uh, began collecting photos and using some software from a, he played a video game, uh, a golf video game wow. that had a function involved where you were allowed to like build your own golf course if you wanted to. And over the course of years, he painstakingly recreated, you know, the Lido for this video game and and the more photographs he could collect and research and dig up old whether it was postcards or aerial photography from the military or whatever you know he got better and better at, at figuring out what the contours were 
And eventually the technology got to the point where I guess Tom Doak was interested in Mike Kaiser and the Kaiser uh, family, Mike Kaiser's sons were, you know, were always kind of interested in this project as well. And, and finally the technology got to the point where they could, from what I understand, they could uh, electronically translate what Peter Flory had done uh, for the video game into a topographical map that was accurate to within, you know, a foot basically. And because the site was completely built out of sand, up in Sand Valley, it makes it easier to, you know, to sculpt into the right, you know, shapes and everything. And it's, uh, it's amazing. I mean, it, it's very dramatic. It's, it's a, um, you know, it is a bold golf course. It's, it's, uh, it's one of those, the first time I played it, it was, you know, it was 45 degrees or something up in uh, Wisconsin. Two weeks ago. <laughs> and the first time I played it, I thought, this is the hardest golf course in the world. And it's not that long. It's like 6,500 yards. And then the second time it gets a lot easier because you know where to miss and where not to miss. Mm. And by the third and fourth times, it's, it's fun because then you kind of know where the challenges are and you know what to, you know, which bunkers to take on and which ones not to. And, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it was, uh, it was fun. So, you know, the obvious question that I think for, you know, golf architect fans and, and people are, okay, if this is possible for the Lido, is it possible for other golf courses as well? You know, could you either, a golf course that no longer exists because there's there's a bunch of them you know that, that aren't aren't around anymore whether it's Seth Rainers or Alistair McKenzie or whoever could you could you you know could we rebuild some of those or could you take a golf course that's famous that's you know a, a private club somewhere in you know France or in UK or whatever and build a copy in Florida you know and and uh, and, and how close could you get that uh, you know as a copy we've all seen these kind of you know, like they call them tribute courses or wherever, where like they, you know, recreate the 12 hole at St. Andrews. But, but this is like to within a foot, you know, every, every square foot of the property is, you know, painstakingly recreated. Um, you know, is that, is that where golf's headed? I don't know. You know, I think there's a limit to some of that stuff, but yeah, it was pretty fascinating. It was, it was fun to play. That's for sure. That is uh, very, very interesting. And Charlie, are you able to cue us up the top a hundred, golf courses that was recently released on the Twitter machine, otherwise known as X. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when I look at this list, I've probably played, uh, if I haven't counted, but I would imagine somewhere between 10 to 20. Now that may be a little on the high side. I could be wrong there, but Michael, I know you've <laughs> seen the list. How many of the hundred have you played? Uh, I have seen this list. Um, I, you know, it has not been, I don't think it's been published in the magazine yet, so we should uh, we should be clear about that. This was, you know, this, this <laughs> no, was it's on Twitter. Man. Everything is true that I read <laughs> yes. on Twitter. <laughs> yes. but, uh, assuming that this list is correct, I think I've played uh, probably about ni- ninety three. I believe is the. Oh, is that it? Is that <laughs> it? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you've been doing all day, Smiley, over there. But uh, you know, yeah, I've been busy. What can I say? I, I like it. You know, I don't. I I like I like the difference in the courses, but I also like just the you know, the difference in how they do it, you know, whether it's in Japan or it's in Australia or it's, mm, you know, wherever, yep. like you go to Australia and like they're, they're dragging their pull carts like right across the green, the putting greens. Like, you you know, you get kicked out of a club in America if you did that. Um, <laughs> but there's no caddies in Australia. They all, you know, they just drag their, and they drag their pull carts right across the greens, but nobody cares. And the greens are so, you know, firm that it doesn't make any difference in Japan. They make you pay for the pencils, you know, like, like <laughs> a little box of pencils. They're like 75 wow. cents a piece. They're like, because they don't want people to like waste them, and they figure you'll you'll appreciate them more if you if you pay for it. Like you won't, you know, you won't end up with That's ten pencils point. in the bottom of your bag. And I just like all the little things like that. I mean, the golf courses obviously are, are special, and uh, it's it's been a thrill. And, and like I said, uh, I, I'm I'm a very lucky guy. I mean, I I, I don't deserve it. That's for sure. Um, I've had a lot of people that have um, invited me to play a lot of nice places uh, for for reasons that are, you know, I, I hope I hope someday I'm in a position to pass it along um to others that's for sure because uh people have been awful nice to me to uh, to let it happen so yeah well i'm sure like whoever created this top 100 list it's 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 all opinionated it's 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 yeah. almost impossible to come up with a perfect list and as i sit here and look at this the the question that comes to my mind is of these 100 golf courses or maybe not even uh, one that's on this top 100 is there a golf course to you that you think if it if it went back to what it used to be or wh- how it was originally designed, that it would be much better than what it is now. And, and there may not be an answer for this. And for me, the the picture that comes to mind, and you've tweeted this picture, I believe it was on your Twitter, 
was the seventh hole at Pebble Beach. And in my head, I'm like, if if the rest of the golf course had characteristics of that sand and dunes, I think that place would play so much cooler. But Pebble is already one of my favorite golf courses in the world. So I'm just curious if you have something that comes to mind. Um, well, Augusta National. Um, I mean, that's an easy one. Um, th- they're in a tough spot where they're the only golf course in the world that hosts you know, the best professionals in the world for a major championship, um, every year. And, mm. you know, it's played, you know, in, in, in the springtime and which is you know nice for the visuals, but, but that can be tough for agronomy and its own challenges and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it, they're in kind of a no win position there, but yeah, definitely Augusta national. When you see the photos, when it opened where there was basically no trees on the property and you could see from, you know, the first tee all the way down to the 13th green, um, it's just, mm. you know, you see that today Beautiful. and you think like, man, like that would be, if it was all wide open like that, it would be so interesting. Um, the course Augusta, when it opened, it was basically the exact same yardage that the, that the, um, young ladies play today for the ANWA for the, for the ladies amateur tournament that's played, played the, uh, you know, the weekend before, um, the masters. Um, I, I almost wonder if they do it like on purpose. Um, I tracked it this year and most of the holes were within like five yards of, of what the original wow. yardages were. So you can see how far back they've had to put some of those pins. Um, there's a lot of courses like that. I think where just for the walkability of it, I, I always think like it's, um, you know, I, I usually play the, like the, you know, 6,500 tees or whatever. I'm not playing 7,500 yards like you guys do, but like, <laughs> it, it, it's such, um, it's such a shame that like it, uh, what it does to the routing where, you know, when you finish on a green, instead of stepping 10 feet away and onto the next tee, you've got to walk a hundred yards backwards to hit one shot and then walk a hundred yards back right to where you were before, you know, most of the golden age courses, whether it was George Thomas out in Los Angeles or Alistair McKenzie in Australia or, or whoever, you know, they designed the golf courses to make them much more walkable to where when you finished one hole, the next tee was right there. And, you know, th- there's a reason why they used to play golf in three hours and now it takes, you know, four hours. And, and that's part of it is just the, uh, you know, there's so much dang longer than now than they used to be. But, uh, you know, yeah. it's a necessary evil, I guess. So, Michael, we, of course, live in in the embrace debate era, right? And so you look at a list of top 100 courses, and, of course, the, the, the place you go from there is let's argue about what should be on there, what shouldn't be on there. So sure. just to kind of tee you up with the obvious question, you know, first, is there a course – on this list or maybe not on this list that's criminally underrated and second uh i don't want to put you in a bad spot but if you're willing to list a course you think is either overrated or maybe it's a really good course but it just shouldn't be on this top 100 list you know, do you have thoughts on either of those two things well I, I, so i would say first of all like ever like you like you said um uh, you know, people take this stuff really seriously and there's a lot of money at stake. I mean, there, there are, um, yeah, there is. Be, being on the top 100 versus not being on the top 100 when somebody's planning their golf trip to, you know, whether it's going to the UK or, or going to, you know, wherever, um, you know, it, in some cases it, you know, makes up their people's minds if they don't know any better on where to play and where not to play. So, you know, um, you know, I hope people take it as a, you know, just a, it's, it's an interesting thing to talk about that in the grill room, right, in, uh, in debate. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I tend to like, um, you know, like I say, I like golf courses. I'm a, you know, seven or eight handicap. So I tend to like more of the Alistair McKenzie courses that have, you know, wide fairways and the short game is really where you're, you know, it gives a chance for the nine handicap like me to maybe, maybe, maybe on a good day, you know, um, give Smiley a game for, you know, nine holes or something <laughs> like that, whereas a Tillinghast course, so, so, Tillinghast was a guy, who, you know, Wingfoot and uh, Beth Page Black and uh, Baltus Roll and places like that. They tend to have, you know, longer, um, you know, par fours and just uh, di- more difficult courses. Um, a lot of them also host major championships still. And so, you know, they're they're kept uh, difficult with difficult rough and stuff like that. And so uh, I would tend to say I like, um, you know, courses that were built by McKenzie Moore and courses built by Tillinghast uh, less, um, just because of that. I, I always find it interesting. Like if you go to like wing foot or to Baltus roll, um, how many times when you're playing with a member, they they'll tell you like, Oh, I really like wing foot East. Like that's where me and my buddies play all the time. But when I have a guest, like we take them over to the West because that's where the <laughs> is and they all want to play the West. Like it's, it's, we don't like getting beat up like that every day. So, you know, for our Thursday morning skins game, we play the East course. And that, that's true at a lot of places. Like, it's amazing 
how many 36 hole facilities um, like Wingfoot, um, the members like the other course um, just as much as, as the, you know, the famous one. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm definitely along those lines too. Uh, if I, you know, if I was a member <laughs> at Wingfoot, um, I would definitely, um, you know, I would find myself in the East course at least as much as on the West course for sure. Yeah. Me and you both, Michael, I think, yeah. I think we can, sh- <laughs> we can shake hands on that one. I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a fair argument, and I think that is probably why this list is so tough to come up with. But you're right in that top 100 golf courses, it means something. When I'm when I'm telling my buddies that I'm going to go play this place, and I'll say, "Yeah, dude, it's a top 100 golf course." That does mean something. So I can imagine that's a very political deal on how to, <laughs> to properly make sure that your golf course is seen on the correct time of the year, on the right day, whatever it is, to make your way in that top 100. But yeah. Very interesting debate. And is there, uh, and just underrated wise, uh, just real quick, what did we get an answer on one that's like just super underrated? It can be on this list or not. Well, so yeah, I, I think, I think a lot of the courses in Australia are underrated. I mean, I know it's a long way to mm-hmm. go, but, um, yeah, you know, if you live on the West coast, it's almost as easy to get to Australia as it is to get to the UK. Um, when I see a mm-hmm. course like, let me see Royal Melbourne East, that's number 92 on the list. I mean, Royal Melbourne East is it's, you know, they use six of the holes when, when you're watching on Australian Open or the Asian, uh, you know, amateur that was on um, Golf Channel earlier this uh, week um, or last week. Uh, you know, they use six of the holes from the East course as, as part of the composite or the President's Cup or whatever. Um, they're just as good, I think. I mean, the East is, you know, just a fraction maybe behind uh, the West, but that's only because the West is considered the, the seventh best course in the world. Um, Victoria that's down there at 96th on the list. I mean, that's another one that's just, it's fantastic. I mean, it's a, just a great, you know, great golf course. And I, I also like, you know, as a tourist, if I'm going to travel and be away from my family and, you know, I like things that are different, you know, I don't, I don't want to go right. see pine trees and, and Bermuda greens and, and Bermuda rough. Cause I got that in, in, you know, Vestavia, Alabama. Um, I like going places to see, you know, how the agronomy kind of, um, also drives differences, whether it's the sand belt with the sharp edges on the bunkers. Or, mm, um, I love that look. Yeah. Oh, or, uh, oh, kind of that. Yeah. The, um, you know, uh, something, you know, t- a totally different look, but, um, another, the London Heathland courses, St. George's Hill, I think is one of the great golf courses in the world. And mm. it's, um, you know, the, Where's the, that on the list, the flowers and the, uh, you know, where is St. George's Hill? It's on there somewhere. Um, it's 71. Oh, yeah, it's 33. Uh, no, no, it's, it's no, yeah, 71. Yeah, yeah, 71 what? is uh, St. George's uh, Hill. So St. George's Saint, Hill is, I heard St. George's. Yeah, St. George's <laughs> Hill. So it's, it's right down the street. I haven't street. played either. Yeah, well, you should. It's, it's So it's a, it's a Harry Cole course. It's right down the street from Sunningdale, uh, Swinley Forest. That, that's a trip. You know, if you've been to St. Andrews in, in, you know, once or twice and you're looking for something different, go to London. It's a great trip to take your wife with, too, because you can take a train out great. from the city. Yeah. You can play Sunningdale. You can play Swinley Forest. You can play St. George's Hill. You can play Woking. Um, those are all fantastic. Now you're you're golf speaking courses. my language now. <laughs> yeah. And they're different. They, they, you know, they've got they've got the heather, uh, you know, which which is the little purple and reddish flowers kind of for the rough. So the rough is literally like flowers. Um, and it's, you know, you got to play like an explosion shot out of it to basically hack it out back into the fairway out of these, um, <laughs> when they're blooming and it's just gorgeous. And, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I love that. I mean, Harry, Harry Colt, that guy knew how to build a golf course. Um, so as a Michael, region, I'd say that's underrated for sure is the London Heath, Heathland courses. Michael, you mentioned St. George's Hill, and, and I'm looking here at an article from uh, the, the UK golf guy, the man that was kind enough to, to track down this list and publicize it so we could debate it. Yeah. And it lists your top 10 courses, your, your favorite 10 courses at, at, in 2020. And, yep. and the list goes St. Andrews, the old course, Augusta National, Cypress Point, Royal Melbourne, St. George's Hill, Crystal Downs, Valley Club of Montecito, National Golf Links of America, Clover Nook Country Club and a Hoopy Match Club. And I'm just wondering, three years on from that, three plus years on from that, does that list stay the same from you? Any amendments you want to make? Any other honorable mentions you want to throw in there for, you know, your top 10-ish courses in the world? Hmm. Boy, that is a tough question. Uh, that's probably still about that. Uh, San Francisco Golf Club is a pretty, 
pretty special place okay. too. Uh, that's a pretty cool place to hang out. I mean, the whole vibe there and the, the memberships, uh, kind of an A plus uh, plus. That's a good club, you know. I, I I like that. As I get older, I kind of appreciate that too. Is is the, you know, when everybody at the club's kind of on the same wavelength and and uh, they're all kind of, you know, they don't have to post a million rules. You just kind of know how to behave yourself and, and what the procedure is. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of obvious. I kind of like that. Um, I. 99% of the golf I play is walking, um, whether it's with a caddy or carrying my own bag. I just, you know, it's the only exercise I get. I'm pretty lazy. So um, <laughs> I like walkable golf courses, and, and that's something on that list. Um, I think every, every club that you uh, named on that list uh, is, is a pretty easily, you know, walkable course. So, yeah, I still go with that list pretty much. Yeah. Well, Michael, you and I have done plenty of walking out at Shoal Creek. Yeah. And, and another place – to find Michael Wolf is on knowing up office hours. It's, it's something that uh, he started over the last year or so posting videos before big events, just about history lessons of golf. So that's another place you can find Michael Wolf, but Michael on this coming Thursday, we are having Gordon Sargent on the podcast. And as you know, you and I both watch Gordon since he was a, I don't even know if teenager is the right word. Probably a young kid is a, is a better way to describe how long we've known Gordon. Just talk about, I mean, what you've seen from him since he's a young age to where he is now and just all the distance that he's put on. And just, I mean, it's, it's kind of wild how I'm in all these places in the world and, and people will find ways to bring up Gordon. And to me, that's so cool watching a kid grow up, um, you know, putting and hitting balls in the same place that I was to what he's been able to accomplish. Yeah. So I, I think first of all, the, is the, the person, um, I mean, um, you know, he's a good kid. Um, I, I said kid, I'm 52 years old. So he's a kid. Um, no, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. I mean, I, I've known his parents, uh, for, for 10 years or so, or 10 plus years. Um, you know, and he's just, uh, you know, solid, I guess is just the word. I mean, good, just good people. Um, you know, and, and humble. And, and I would expect that to stay the same, no matter how the journey goes. I mean, whether it goes where a lot of people think it's going to go or, or it doesn't, um, I, I think that'll stay the same. His, you know, his father, uh, you know, has played U.S. amateurs and, and gotten to do a lot of special things and, and you'd never know it. Um, he, he certainly wouldn't tell you. He'd be the last guy to tell you. My memory is of Gordon. So the first time I played or I saw the first time I saw him playing was he played a match against my son um, at country club of Birmingham, just a nine hole, like PGA mm -hmm. league match. And, um, he was good. I mean, he was really good, but the one that sticks out was, I think that same year, and this was probably, I think it was 10 years ago. So he was, Gordon was probably nine years old, 10 years old. So mm -hmm. we have the, at Shoal, we have a little, you know, nine hole par three course and we play the eggnog classic and it's, oh, and yeah. it's an event that's, you know, uh, <laughs> it was, quite a bit of eggnog involved but it's also kind of a nice way to introduce your kids to you can, they can come out and it's just nine holes so it's 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 for golfers non-golfers it's always the uh saturday before christmas every year and corn came out when he's nine years old and the first thing i remember was somebody like pointed out to me they're like this kid's really like you should watch this kid they're like how big his shoes were and how big his hands were and they're like i mean they were like man-sized shoes at nine years old and the first hole was like 150 yards and he hit like a nine iron and he's, you know, he's nine years old. I mean, it was just insane. <laughs> and it's just, it's just been a pleasure to watch him, um, you know, grow. And, and, um, he's, um, I'm the starter for the Alabama golf association for the Alabama high school, um, state championships every year. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of good kids to play high school golf in Alabama. And, um, you know, Gordon is the best one I've ever seen. That's for sure. And again, he, the way he carries himself and, and behaves and whether things are going well or not well. Um, it was um, just a thrill to watch. I went over to the Walker cup and uh, that, that was just, uh, that, that was one of the more great uh, golf experiences I got to have in my life was, you know, how he played and, uh, you know, conducted himself and, and Nick Dunlop too. I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't leave out Nick. Um, he's another, you know, Birmingham boy and uh, local and um, you know, both of them um, just played great and, represented you know birmingham and alabama and the you know united states of america and uh, i expect big things from both of them but but i know you know no matter what happens uh you know they'll you know they're good good guys and uh, gordon will have a good future I, I will give you one fun fact you can you can give him a little uh, grief out uh, i'll tell you something that gordon's not good in at golf so he caddied for me he, i think i was the last <laughs> person he ever caddied for so just to show you um for our member member tournament uh this was only like three years ago i think he was a senior 
in high school and he'd probably already, well, he'd already signed with Vanderbilt, but, um, you know, his dad makes, there's Gordon and his, and his brother, Thomas, um, and Gordon and Thomas, um, uh, the, their father made them come out and caddy because, you know, the club needed, you know, remember, remember, we need a lot of caddies. And so he made a, he makes them come out and caddy because the caddy master was looking for warm bodies to carry a bag. And poor Gordon got put on my bag, and uh, he never complained. But there were a few eye rolls and a few, you know, I'm trying to hit five iron out of Bermuda rough. It's two inches deep, and he's kind of looking at it. And, you know, every once in a while I'd be lining up a putt, and I'm looking over my shoulder to maybe get a read from Gordon, and he's like, you know, he's fiddling around with my wedges. And uh, so I think I was maybe the last person uh, that Gordon has ever caddied for, and I would expect to, I'd expect to hold that record for uh, – for the time being but like i say the uh, the main takeaway is just a good guy and uh, you know the uh, the ball speed and all that stuff uh, i'm no expert on on the technical side of things but man he he can hit it and it is different than than everybody else in golf i, I uh, you know it's uh, it's something you know if he can dial in those irons and the flights and all those things i think that's uh, you know that separates the you know the good amateurs from the, the top pros is can they you know can they do it in all the conditions and around the world and all that stuff but uh, got a good head on the shoulders that's for sure so oh absolutely and i tell you what i'm always cognizant of when gordon is hitting on one side of the range to make sure i'm not on the other side of the range yeah. so i don't yeah. catch one to the dome but <laughs> as yeah. you said we've had Mal- Malinax, we've had too. yeah yeah more next uh, yeah he hammers yeah. it <laughs> yeah the difference between trey and gordon is when gordon uh, accidentally fires one into you he goes like this and when trey does it he he laughs you know and, and uh, when i'm running for cover so, uh, that's the only difference between those two, but uh, yeah, they're, uh, it's amazing how far how far the ball goes with those guys. I I can't even see it anymore. I mean, I uh, granted, like I say, I'm in my mid fifties, but uh, I, I you know I've kind of Hermy uh, Jimmy Herman uh, has has threatened uh, that that I might be making a appearance on his bag uh, uh, in, a, in a future date, and uh, I haven't I haven't caddied for him in probably the last time I caddied for him was in the BMW on the uh, Pro Am at the. Uh, in Greenville, South Carolina, when he was on the national ride. So that was at least like 15 years ago. And, um, I don't, I can't even track the ball anymore. Like they go so far, like up in the air, it's hard to even like follow them, but, uh, it's amazing. Well, Michael, thank you, my man. This has been a, a great conversation. You know, I, this is, yep. uh, just being able to talk golf and, uh, architecture golf courses, uh, just our, our relationship going all the way back to Shoal Creek. This is, it's been very fun. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me guys. What a fun conversation, Smiley, with Michael Wolf, a uh, buddy of yours in the Birmingham, Alabama area, and, and just like an exci- encyclopedia of golf course knowledge. As, as I said, as an inspiring sicko, I aspire to be like him. Yes, uh, 100%. And I didn't really get a chance to go too much into it, but the the Southern Hills, like the amount of information I had about like the clubhouse, like uh, what the original design was. And it just <laughs> I had all this info, like where the old uh, country club pool was. And I'm just walking around watching live golf. I'm like, Oh, I, mean, I guess if I was a play by play guy, all this stuff would be useful information, but calling what a seven iron was doing. I was like, okay, I don't need to know quite as much about the golf course as, uh, as I thought I might need to know, but, <laughs> um, really cool. I, I will say the Augusta National answer is saying what golf course yes. should go back or could go back to their um, original design and it would make it better. That to me was really interesting answer. Now I just want to go and see what the original design was, knowing like how the modern Augusta National plays. So to me, that like I want to I want to sink my teeth into that and see what that looks like. Well, it's such a smart answer because it's the reality they live with is they have to host perhaps the the biggest tournament on the golf calendar yeah, every single year. But it's like if you could almost split it, they, they could get a, a piece of property right next door that was the exact same footprint. And they could do one course that had a classic feel for members that's shorter and do one course that's manicured and up to the standards of, of a, a major championship. You know, they, they could you know fulfill kind of both things. But that was I found that. I found that super interesting. So, um, and as you noted at the end there, he will not be the last Birmingham, Alabama native on the show this week is I'm so fired up for Thursday's conversation with Gordon Sargent. Uh, We're hoping to do that in a similar style to Victor Hovland, where, you know, where we were looking at Victor's bunker shots and short game. We're going to be just watching Gordon launch bombs off the tee at absurd ball speeds. Uh, Anything you want to tease there or stuff you're looking to unpack when we have Gordon on the show? I think just one of the things I'm looking forward to talking to him about is just 
how fast it's been going for him. You know, mm. he went from being a everybody knew about him in Alabama to now everybody knows about him that follows golf at a uh, a high level of just being a, a very high amateur ranked player to now the number one amateur in the world to then ending up at Augusta last year, just kind of out of nowhere with an invite and just about how the last year has been for him and now getting the PGA tour U uh, exemption to be able to play the PGA tour. If he wants to leave school, whether he wants to drop that on us or not, whether he's going to come back for his senior year, I imagine a lot of it has to do with how he finishes, uh, the year off, but I'll tell you what, I, it's it's a great problem to have. I'll say that much. It most certainly is. So that will be in the podcast feed and on our YouTube channel on Thursday. So we appreciate you listening and watching, and we will see you then. I've actually watched a couple of episodes of, of, of y'all earlier. It just started popping up on my YouTube, so I was like, yeah, I'll check it out. And uh, you guys have some good takes. So thanks for uh, thanks for what you guys do. So I, I'm happy to come on and. That is a stamp of approval from Mr. Victor Hovland.